Today, we are talking about why private equity keeps investing in accounting firms. This is this is crazy. Another just big one this week. It just happened again. Um, it was actually at a firm that this guy right here was a partner at. And so we're going to figure out what is going on. Why is this happening? Should we expect more of it? All of that here on Drink While You Think, the weekly happy hour conversation where two guys are building their accounting firm in really weird ways. I'm your host, Kenji, my co-host here, Matthew. Um, Matthew, what are we? What are you drinking and who's our sponsor this week? I don't know. I don't know what we're drinking because I think you brought it. Did you, you brewmaster today, right? Oh, okay. look at this. He's got a growler for us, folks. Not just a big old so. coffee mug. It is a growler that I filled off my keg this morning. Let's hope it's still somewhat carbonated. Yeah. Ooh. This week's episode is sponsored by Kenji Kuramoto. Kenji Kuramoto, the name you can't spell. Kenji Kuramoto for all of your home brewing needs. So thank you, Kenji. You're welcome. This is a... Uh, what are we drinking? What is it? This is another Saison. Has a little bit of a funkiness to it. Yeah, that, that was actually the sound when it opened up. I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Lighting bombs off here and there. Oh, this this week's episode is sponsored by my mom because she bought me this shirt that says, if you're on the podcast, beer is cheaper than gas. So it says, drink, don't drive. So that's awesome. Oh, my God. So gosh. cheers, man. Oh, cheers. Wow. Thanks to your mom, too, for your great shirt. Yeah. So that's awesome. And uh, for those of you that, haven't seen this in a while. I am, in fact, taller than Kenji. That's not an illusion on on your screen. So I know that's the problem with Zoom is you don't get height relative heights. Kenji's always shorter than people think, and I'm always taller than people think when you meet us in person. So, well, cool. I'm, what also, do, I'm also smarter and better looking than people think too. So oh yeah, I'll, I'll take the I'll take the shorter thing. Yeah, he's shorter but better looking. He bench presses more than me. It's really really pisses me off. <laughs> so. <laughs> and I do more push-ups than you. You do more push-ups, bench press more, like I know. And shots of tequila. One sometimes, day. Sometimes we mix all those together. I got a 12-month horizon on benching more than you, by the way. So you better. You're bigger than me. I should be able to. <laughs> we'll get there. We're going to keep going. Um, okay. All right. Enough of that. Maybe one day we'll do a workout series where you and I work out together and drink what you think. That'd be awful for everyone. Um, let's get in and talk about this, though. Again, it's June 29th. It was just announced that a top 25 firm that you used to work at, Cherry Beckert, um, announced they received the strategic private equity um, investments from a firm called Parthenon Capital. I think they're in the Carolinas. Um, I guess just as a setup, Matthew, you were at Cherry Beckert. Tell us what you used to do there. And then I get them curious based on your experience there. It's been a little while. Second part of that, like, are you surprised by this? But yeah, first, backdrop on you and Cherry Becker. Well, um, first of all, uh, I, I was a partner. I was an audit partner at Cherry Becker. So I was in the technology practice there uh, doing audits. I also did SEC audits uh, for, for PCOB registrants. So uh, known those folks for a long time, have a great relationship with them, really respect them, had a wonderful career there, um, you know, owe a lot of kind of my development um, from moving from a, uh, I kind of was an auditor for Merchant Young when I came there. And then I kind of left more of a business person, um, got all of my sales and marketing training there, That my formal sales and marketing training that we didn't learn on the job here, um, but uh, left there nine years ago and have kept up with uh, all the partners there. So wonderful folks. Um, at the time I was there, uh, probably closer to a, it's still in the top 25, but probably closer to a $150 million firm. Probably, I bet they're 250 to 300 yeah. million now um, in revenue. Um, I don't, I don't know the partner count, but I would guess they're, um, well, that completely changed uh, with a private equity deal. So it doesn't matter. Partners don't matter. It's all members now. So it's, it's, it's crazy. Are you okay? I assume back when you were there as a partner, was anything like this ever even discussed or mentioned? Oh no. <laughs> Oh no, um, I, I, I'm, I'm. So yeah, are you well, surprised by? I guess mean, when you, you asked, what, yeah, like if I was changed, you asked if I was surprised. I did. And then there's kind of a yes and no answer for that. Uh, yes, I was surprised. Um, I don't know why. Um, they, 
the, 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 the demographics of Cherry Beckert are that they tend to be in uh, second tier cities in the Northeast because the Northeast dominated first. So they're, they're on all the major markets, but they all, they're really heavy in the second tier markets. So um, I was a little surprised in, in, in maybe the PE firms picking them as one to do, but um, the firm itself, I feel like um, if you go back to its roots, was really rooted in technology and kind of being in front of the curve. So if you go back to when they got started and the tax software that they developed and stuff like that, um, back like this is 40 years ago, um, it doesn't surprise me that they're on the leading edge of this. Um, but, you know, I've always thought, you know, Michelle, Kip, Kurt, those guys that are running the firm, I'm sure there's other people heavily involved in this transaction, are really kind of, um, they're really thoughtful about the space. Um, and so it was really interesting. They've done a great job too with better than a lot of the top 25s with um, succession planning and um, managing uh, a lot of firms get busted up with the retirement uh, plans uh, with partners like disproportionately paying to the retired partners. They've done a great job managing that. So it doesn't surprise me that they were able to put this together in short order. So I wonder if it's one of those where it's like, because you do, and we do know them so well, it's almost more of a surprise because you're like, you just, it makes sense when you step back and you're more objective about it. Like when you know someone so well, you're like, oh, it's. It just, was initially surprising yeah, to me, yeah. but like, but like when I thought about it, I was like, oh no, this is in their DNA. So it was, yeah. it was great. And I'm really excited um, after talking to a couple of them that um, about it because they're excited about it. Um, I was really worried about the audit partners um, because they're doing the audit partner spin off. So, um, but after talking to them, I understand a little bit better that 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 is not as big of a deal. So this is technically this is the third top twenty five firm to do this. It's all happened the last year. The first Eisner Amper. I think most people know about them. That was August of last year. So we're right about the year mark. Yep. Um, and then uh, Citrin Cooperman. I kind of forgotten about them. Josh Lance, our buddy, reminded me about them. Um, I assume they're a Midwestern firm just because Josh knows a lot about them as the Midwest. Um, so it's three firms. I think theirs was done in April. Um, is this a trend? What's going? What do you think? I totally think it's going to be a trend. And I think what, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead on your topic since mm -hmm. I don't know where you're going, but um, um, I think private equity has finally caught up to the the notion that there's so much that this this space is is at least has the potential for consolidation like other spaces have in the past when uh, the studies that i've seen show that there's over 100,000 accounting firms in the united states i think private equity has finally realized um that fact and i think they're starting to understand the economies of scale and then also i think private equity has a little bit of fomo generally so as soon as they the, tend to. as soon as the Eisner Amper deal happened, oh, like man, the other goodness. firms are like, oh, we gotta have one of those in our portfolio. So now we have three of the private equity firms with accounting firms in their portfolio, um, really going after the SMBs. So um this is a this is a play to private equity, I would imagine that is who control who's the trusted SMB whisperer. <laughs> Like Ooh, and, yes. and if you looked at trusted professions, accounts at the top. So I'm surprised this hasn't happened sooner, actually. So yeah, I want to dig into more of the whys and we'll do that in just a second. Before we jump there, you you mentioned being, you know, an audit partner. And I think that impacts the structure of these deals because I think all three of them have had to go make some structural changes to accommodate this. Let's yeah. talk about those, what they did and kind of why they did them, right? So it's a they broke the firms are testing into two, right? Yeah, they broke it into two. So Colin's going to run. Um, sorry if I am familiar with folks. They're just people I know and like. So Colin's going to run the audit practice, which is the they set up a separate LP for the audit practice. And the only people that can be um, partners in an audit practice are CPAs. So there's a separate. So the audit partners are going and doing that. Colin's going to run that, and then Michelle, who's the current CEO, is going to run the uh, Cherry Beckard Advisory. I think this is very similar to what the other people are, but I'm- I think it's the same way. It was, it was so, business, business audit set over here, business advisory and all other non-attest in the other entity is what I yeah, heard. Is that's that right? right. So okay. everything is in the other one. 
So, but um, what I understand that some of the firms are doing, and I think they're all doing a little bit differently, is that they're creating basically outsource arrangements between the firms. So all of the at, all of the employees are kind of employees of one firm and not the other, and then they're leased back to the other one. And I assume that's the advisory one, but I think that's the arrangement. So um, all the so you, the structure that, as I understand it, really doesn't help like the audit firm with uh, independence problems or anything like that. So they're still going to have all those problems because they still are maintaining ownership of the advisory group. So they're going to have all the independence problems um, that they had. So that this doesn't solve that problem. Uh, that was a misconception I had coming in that they were trying to solve that. So I think they're just trying to solve the liquidity problem of the of the partners and not well, not the independence problem and just to, that just, I was perceiving. If I heard you correctly, splitting off because a firm that does attest services cannot be owned by someone who, who doesn't have a CPA doesn't license. Doesn't have a CPA license. So that's really, I don't want to call it a formality. Is that all they're really doing then is just saying, well, if that's an issue in a CPA firm, I'm sorry, in a, in a test based firm, we just have to carve that thing out and side stick it over here and move as much value and people and assets over to where the new capital is, which is okay. So it's more. Right. Like, so that's the reason why we see them. And then, yeah, and so I don't know how all of them work, but I'd assume that the audit partners would break off and not have any ownership of the other entities. And that, what I understand is that's really not how, that's not the deal. I think the audit partners and, and the uh, consulting partners and tax partners still want to be all aligned. So I think they're coming up with creative structures to do that um, and, and then maintain um, the respect to the AICPA rules about the test services and, and, and doing that and the ownership that's required for CPA firms. So the only CPA firm here, at least in the Cherry merger, actually in all three mergers, the, C, the only CPA firm, I believe, is the audit group going forward. The tax group and the consulting group um, are in just um, LLCs yeah, yeah, that aren't formal CPA firms. Which would be fun because then they can change their names to like random stuff. They don't have to have people in their names. Oh, and yeah, all that kind of that's stuff. true. So, they can get out of so, so I'm waiting for that. Like when is Eisner Emperor, the consulting going to rebrand as like Progresso or like, <laughs> or like Aprio already did, right? Yeah. So Aprio did it, but they did that. Um, Everyone, one, yeah. one of them had to change their name to uh, Aprio, their middle name, to be able to do that, which still. Respect for that. Respect to respect uh, to Richard, to Cole, Richard, Richard. Aper, Aprio Copelman. So, so that, that, that's like, there you go, man. Well, let's give him the whys here a little bit. Um, I, we talked, you kind of tipped in this a minute ago. And I want to break down the why would someone do this and the two, into the two, you know, constituents here. Let's talk about why the accounting firm would do it first. Then we'll talk about why the PE firm. And I'll just read something here. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting. At least here's why. Here's what the accounting firms said, right? And I'll read these out. Here are the various press releases why they said they would do this. Um, quote: We want to provide additional investment in technology, infrastructure, and other key areas that will enable us to better serve clients. Tech. Okay. Another one of these said: Help us enhance our core services, expand new advisory service offerings, and develop technology capabilities for abilities for even better service to our clients. And then finally, they said. Accelerating the evolution of service offerings, investing in talent and tech, and strategically expanding organic growth and targeted M&A, all directed at enhancing client service. So lots of <laughs> lots of press release investment mumbo, mumbo jumbo. jumbo. Yeah. Yes, all so. of that in there. What what are they really saying here? What's the real value for an accounting firm in taking on P? Mm -hmm. Number one, number one is headline. Like this is a battle for people. And if you're taking PE, you automatically go to the front of the line for progressive accounting firms to me. Like in people's head, at least in a subset of people's head. Some, I, I can debate I mean, you a little you, bit. You, but, but like, you're no longer thought of you're, as you're, like you're antiquated. Sign, you're signing up for that, right? You're, oh, you're, yeah. You're, you're like, pushed. you're not antiquated, right, yeah. anymore. Like, you're not old school, whatever. You're like cutting edge. So I think number one is like, maybe not number one, but it's up there. It's up there that you're keeping up. You're keeping up with the Joneses and 
you are progressive. Okay. I think in all three of those, you know, kind of whatever they were, gobbledygook press release, they all mention technology and investment there, right? So they, okay. there is a forward so, so the, as part of that. So, right? Yeah. Push so from say. the technology aspect, 100%. Like that, the, the there is, they, all of these firms, I believe, are going to build technology. Okay. The reason the private equity was needed to do that, though, was disalignment. Okay, and sustainability, I think, which is a bigger reason why do they do this. One of the things that I was considering when I left public accounting was it was a trade off, right? They had these legacy defined benefit plans for retired partners, and that was going to be my liquidity if I stayed at Cherry Becker, right? So I think one of the things that they had to do, they had to resolve all the old liabilities, future liabilities with these deals. So these three firms, I can't imagine have liabilities anymore to old partners. So the kind of the- so kind of cleaning that up, not the cap table, but really- That is a cap table, really. It is, it is a cap table because, because we're looking those to people take up. distributions and there was no other liquidity. So they took the future distributions, I presume, there's a couple of things here, right? Because there's the current owners and there's the other people that have rights to distributions. I assume the private equity cut those people out. I don't know that for a fact on any of these, but like if I'm private, I mean, I know private equity and they don't want dead, you know, people that can't contribute on the cap table, right? So presumably they took all those people out and, and clear, they also don't like unknown liabilities. So they probably killed those. So from a sustainability perspective, I think with a lot of firms where they get tripped up is these old partner retirement plans, right? And not planning for those accordingly and not thinking about things that you need in the second generation, third generation, fourth generation. So huge deal behind this is a sustainability play, like killing, def so defined benefit plans, one of the last places I saw defined benefit plans, and they've been gone almost everywhere else. Right. Like they're gone now. For the no, new, the new age, uh, yeah. So now it'll be like you got your four hundred one k, and then you have these liquidity points when the private equity turns over, right? So I think that was probably a bigger deal um, in all three of these firms. Thinking is like kind of creating better alignment and sustainability allows for the technology kind of investments, if you know what I mean. So by doing by taking out the old partners. And by giving liquidity to partners in in, in their stages, um, they actually create better alignment to where people are more willing to invest in technology. Well, the, the old historical thing was like, if I'm one year from retirement, I don't want us spending a million bucks on technology because I want my distribution to be maxed out. Like, I don't care what the future growth is. And, I, and my cash flow is already determined for the future by my defined benefit plan. So like we're disaligned. On, on, on where we put the money. And so in simple terms, I'm almost thinking about there's a there's a disalignment between the older retired or retiring partners and the new partners. Right? That's that right. disalignment there. And this, I think to your point, is if you came in and put money into something a new initiative or it put new capital into something you want to see grow, can you resolve that disalignment by saying, yep, these folks are pretty much out. Let's satisfy our obligation there. But let's open things up and free up the new partners who are going to be running the organization. That's so just, right. That's and, the and everybody who stayed has now equity in an LLC and they're all aligned because if you create equity value in the company, that goes up for them, right? So it's not all about cash flow in these companies anymore. It used to only be about cash flow for partners. How much income can I produce and how much can I stow away in my defined benefit plan? But that was pegged. Right now, it's like, okay, how much equity value can I make in the next six years? What's going to be really fun, interesting, like, is how much are the the changes like in the investments going to happen right before leading up to the flip, like like the like seven so, years so from now. So when you say the flip, right? You're 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 talking. If I hear you right, you're talking about the natural. Time, the typical timelines within a PE firm or investor for when they need to see some liquidity, when they need so, to see so, some monetization of it. Yeah. So what I presume is going to happen, either that these private equity funds will have a new vintage fund and they'll come in and take out the investment in this fund and recap the partners based on age or some formula that they pre-agreed to, or another private equity fund will come in 
and do the recap for them. So one of two things is going to happen. Like the existing private equity is going to have some rights to be able to recap it every six years or every seven years, or a new private equity fund will come in and recap it and have some similar protocol. So it'll be really interesting to see as it gets closer to those liquidity dates, if those are contractual, because I don't know if that's a forced thing. I mean, I can imagine like accountants being pretty risk averse and asking for some forced liquidity every six or seven years. But um, it'll be interesting to watch this. And like, we're, I mean, I'm going to kind of set my calendar for 2028 to see <laughs> like what Eisner Emperor is going to do because they're going to be the first. They, well, I mean, they probably won't be the first one because somebody will recap somebody. Yeah. Yeah. As private equity comes in. Well, let's flip over to private equity. And on the oh, lot, oh, the can I say one more yeah, thing? Well, yeah, because the other thing you said was they're talking about mergers. And I think that having dry powder is going to fundamentally change how these three firms do acquisitions. I agree. I think there's going to be a heavier cash component to acquisitions than ever been in the space, which is fascinating to me because the space has relied on these five-year payout deals. Um, so that's going to change. There's no way private equity is going to like private equity might do some of that stuff, but I think private equity is going to be like, let's drive this to more certainty. Let's pay it out earlier. Potentially. Let's, let's I mean, get these things to happen too. PE is known for levering things up too at times though. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're, they'll take out debt but, to do it, but they might know I'll pull the money in, but, but, they, but, I think but the, but the targets will get paid more up front. Targets should, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's going to be interesting. I, I would agree with you. I think the velocity now, if you get some of these big firms that dry powder in them, we should see M and A activity start heating up for sure. For sure, a, a few reports I've heard of but, it already happening with some of these firms. So, but I think there's no, like, there is no, like, there's no circumstance where I don't where, where Cherry Becker or one of these firms, you know, say they're three hundred million now, where in six years they're less than seven hundred fifty million. 600 like there's no yeah. way they're not doubling in six years um and, and some of them are probably targeting a, being a billion dollar firm in six years uh so tripling in six years so um i think activity is going to heat up pretty quick um what will be fascinating is, is if other top 25s start combining into these structures that they cherry pick whoever has the best structure you know it's going to be a war of structures at some point you at know some point um Okay, let's go to the PE firm side of it. Yeah. Why do these PE firms do it? And again, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll read another press well, release, right? Why, so the, why the PE firms did it? Why the okay. PE firms did it, right? And so this this here is from Parthenon Capital. Um, of why they talk, here's their quote. We are eager to collaborate with the Cherry Beckert team to support continued strong growth for both organically and through strategic acquisitions that allows the firm to achieve its full potential as one of the country's leading professional service organizations, end quote. That sounds a lot like a roll-up to me. Are we here? Is that, is that just a lot of fancy words around? They want to see this, again, it was said, through strategic acquisitions. They want to see they want to see growth. They want to see a roll-up. Is that what you're hearing, what you're guessing? Yeah, I mean, it's all about cash flow to PE. So I think there's a couple of angles here for PE. One is uh, accounting firms are relatively recession proof. So yeah. going after accounting firms during a recession, not very surprising, right? Um, so like they're relatively recession proof. So there's like PE, like VC, if VC was coming in, they're like listening for the fence, whatever. PE is like, I want something with limited downside, and if we execute our plan, it hits our numbers and we get our 3X or 6X or whatever return. They're not going for the 100X outcomes, right? So there's that. So if you were going to ask me about spaces that were like ripe for a 2X, 3X, 6X downside protection and with downside protection, it's accounting firms, right? The second thing is like, there is a holy grail of, selling into other portfolio companies and if you can like tap into ever figure out how accountants can help do that for your firm like that's 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 the legitimate holy grail i think um that they're thinking of long term like i don't know that they're baking that into their model um but they're definitely trying to see if the firm that they 
the firm they acquire and the firms they acquire and build up, say they build a billion dollar firm, like that they're influencing small that the markets that they're in to choose their portfolio companies um, in, in a sense. And I think there's a bunch of other ancillary services that, that get sure. lopped in here pretty quick. Too. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree with the thesis on, um, I still say it's, it's a roll up play that has some nice upside to it. It's nice. It's not, I don't think any of us who are in the profession think you can get some crazy multiples off of accounting firms or professional services as a whole. Um, so it's nice upside with very limited downside because it's going to say, hey, when's the last time you really heard about a big accounting firm going out of business? Well, actually, we were at it. You and I, you and I worked at that one. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Not a cute um, but, uh, but But it rare. Just don't shred documents or, you know, things like that. And you should be just fine. Um, and I think your final point, about the other ancillary pieces, I think that is something interesting to others because accountants do hold this kind of trusted space within our clients, always finding ways to tack on new service lines. It's pretty incredible when you look at like the top 25 yeah. or larger firms, how many different service lines can be created. So you are kind of investing in something that has got lots of different avenues for potential opportunities to push some more services or more offerings the ways of small businesses. So I, I can see why that's appealing to private equity. Um, okay. So be ready. We think more of this is probably coming. More of this is coming. We think even smaller firms be on the lookout. You should hear a lot more of these folks probably knocking on doors. I don't know. So smaller, but like, I don't know about that. See, I think. What would you say size? Why one of the things for? about private equity. And I mean, we can just talk about our experience there too is like the private equity at least the one we really got deep with wanted us to be a 200 million dollar firm in a really short time horizon so and they concluded even at our size that that was not feasible in a five year horizon so at 10 million or we were at seven or six at the time i can't mm -hmm. remember what it was right so i think i think it's going to not impact anybody outside of the top 100 maybe 200 i was gonna say for a I'm while say three four hundred okay you're probably right yeah so i think i think you got to be like 25 million in revenue to play with this group because you're thinking like a cherry becker they've got to grow to this size they've got to get to a billion dollars now in 10 years or six years or whatever their right. Right. map shows well, they're going to go after the $25 million firm and the $100 million firm and the $50 million firm way before they start trying to add a $10 million Little firm guys, or, guys. Or, or a, and then if you're a million dollar firm, they got to add a hundred of those to make a dent, you know? So I, I, I think, um, I think it's a very, very good. So I think the big private equity will probably stay away but I think they'll be like the mid cap private equity will be interested in getting to a $50 million firm that would sell to one of those. You know what I mean? Sure. So I sure. think like the trickle down effect is who's going to be the next one to build a $50 million firm because instead of having partner problems or other problems, they have a problem where they're going to want to build it to 50 and then exit to somebody else. So I think that'll come. I'm sure people have done some of that then and, and those will be lower profile right. uh, might not have hit the news yet. Uh, maybe that's the exit plan for like uh, I saw decimal raise 9 million bucks, right? Maybe they're thinking that if they can build it to this, but I don't know They're I think they're still getting SAS valuations like pilot and stuff like that. So sure. that still doesn't work for the, the VC math. I, I don't know. I, maybe one day I'll understand what that, that, <laughs> that, um, that exit strategy is well like you said though if there's people out there who need to put money to work you're always gonna see strange unusual things give us a call yeah call us up call hey, us up want, just give us a ring give us a ring, ring. we're going to entertain okay. interesting conversations right yeah uh, do you want to we say that we, like, you, we have no retirement baggage nothing like that come on like <laughs> we don't have any of the 
oh, we don't have an LLP model. We're already not an accounting firm. We don't have to split anything off. And like, that, it's way easier. And now everyone goes, realizes why Kenji Kuramoto was the sponsor of this episode, yeah. right? It was like, hey, this isn't really a podcast. It's an advertisement for us at the firm, which is completely not true, kind of sort of true. We've been pretty damn happy being, as we say, you know, GD, oh. GDI. And yeah. ind independent over here. Independent. Um, but it'll really be an interesting time. I think it was it was it was fun kind of seeing what happened. It's great that it's with a firm that you were at had a ton of respect for. I don't know if they respect me since I got them drunk and stole them away from there. But we have a bunch of friends there. We're we're excited for the Cherry Beckert folks and kind of what's gonna happen. Oh yeah, for sure. It'd be Congrats. fun to kind of it'd be fun to kind of watch that and see uh see what happens there. But we'll keep tracking that here. Um let's let's get into the more important things of Yes, this is my beer we're drinking today. You got to rate it. There's a little more left if you want. I okay, yeah, I don't have any left. Come on. Here. Um, and you're so, like, you, you're not drinking your own. I just poured more for me. Oh, okay. But you just didn't pour uh, for me at the time. I did not. Um, again, this is a Saison. I kind of make these on the regular. This is one for me. It's a, a again, it's a, um, it's a Belgian Saison. I, I, I like the Saisons a lot. I drink a bunch of this at home. When you have a keg in your basement, you kind of end up doing that. Uh, but I give this one. I'm a three seven five on this one. It's oh, okay. I'm going. I'm going four seven five. It's an easy sipper, man. Like he like he. This is when he's nice to me. When I actually put a beer in his hand and I, and I made it, he's very very giving in his ratings and scores. Four seven uh, four okay. seven five. This I, is an easy. I'm not a size under here, and this is an easy sipper. It's not like I got another one coming. But we'll crack open before football season. We'll use it for football season. It's a good easy drinker. Matthew's we're, we're teaching Matthew at during tailgates to how to pace easy drinking beer so we'll have that in here that one's about done about to come out of fermentation this weekend so we'll have that in a little bit but hey everybody it's great to have you on here we'd love to hear your take on um what's happening in the space with PE we're excited in a few weeks we're going to be up doing the unique CPAs three-year anniversary podcast with Randy oh, Crabtree. Live. Gonna, live, gonna live be, in Chicago. We'll be doing so. some special things up there. We're already planning for Drink While You Think to collaborate with them. We'll be up at Beer Temple. The Beer Temple in Chicago. The bunch of other folks. One of the people up there that I'm really excited to meet, um, Alan Colton. Alan's up there. I've read a bunch of his things. He's going to be part of it. Alan is super involved and I think helped advise some of these firms in these mergers. So, We'll be bending his ear, trying to learn from him because yeah, he really has some for real information, real so. good information with Alan. Uh, so excited to meet him and see Randy and a bunch of other folks in a couple of weeks. All but, we got, all we got now is speculation. So we'll hope we come I'm back on. for you guys next come like, here. in a couple of weeks and so make some real stories. Here. So it'll be mm -hmm. fun. Well, cheers, everyone! Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here on Drink While You Think.